I'm exceedingly optimistic, which means that I need to be even more cautious because uh, runs like this don't last forever. And this one has been surprising on multiple fronts and it's an exciting time. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the AJR Mining Guy on Twitter and, of course, your host for this channel. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation now. It's the only person really worth staying up late for. It's 10 p.m. where I am, and I usually don't do late interviews. It's, it make, makes the days really long, but it's worth it for Gary Wagner. Because Gary is based in Hawaii. I'm based in Germany. 12-hour time difference, but we're going to make this work because it's really worth it. Gary's a phenomenal technical analyst. He's the CEO and uh, CTO. Chief Market Strategist, Head Honcho, brains behind the operations over at the Gold Forecast. And I'm really looking forward to dissecting the gold and silver price with him. As, as we're recording, of course, we're trading at a new all-time high. Gary mentioned to me, don't worry about it. It happens every other day these days, so it's not that special. But uh, we still have to dissect it. And of course, I want to know how strong this bull market or this run in gold is right now. Before I switch over to my guest, friendly reminder, hit that like and subscribe button. Helps us out tremendously bringing guests like Gary on, and it helps with our reach. Thank you so much. Now, without much further ado, Gary, it is phenomenal to see you again. Thanks so much for making the time. Great to be back. Great to, to chat with you during these exciting times where we're living in the history book, so to speak, uh, with, with what gold has been doing recently. And it's been a while. And uh, I'll, I'll always do an interview as early as you need. You'll stay up as late, but we'll connect somewhere in the middle. It is great to be here. It always works. So I had to reschedule once because I was sick last uh, 10 days ago, but uh, we're making this happen. It was worth the wait, I'm pretty sure. As you said, uh, new all-time highs were it's unique times. It's a 5,000-year-old relic, and we get to see all-time highs. We get to experience that, which is quite unique. But uh, let's maybe try to summarize a little bit. Let's, let's set the scene here, Gary. Like, How enthusiastic are you? Because when we spoke last, which was already in January, by the way, um, you were optimistic, but you were cautious. And... Uh, yeah. For, for for gold. How, has that changed? I'm uh, I'm exceedingly optimistic, which means that I need to be even more cautious because uh, runs like this don't last forever. And this one has been surprising on multiple fronts. And it's an exciting time because we've seen in terms of a historical basis, gold really run to a new all-time record close on three occasions since April of this year. And I was just thinking about something that really hasn't gone in my head prior to the introduction. And that is, I recall what it was like middle of 2011 when gold hit the first major new all-time record high and breached 1900. My God, um, that was an exceedingly interesting time. I remember thinking it's going to go straight to 2000. And rather than do that, it fooled around. It traded in a range between 1900 and 1800 before collapsing. And then over a five-year period, uh, not finding support till 1020. And that was in... Uh, the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. And I remember when it happened because there was a report that George Soros was buying. And I thought, finally, we have a bottom after all these years. This is different. It's different in that we've seen gold trade to an all-time record high, move back down. But the corrections, if you can even call them that, these small dips have been shallow at best. And it's a different environment because every time there's some weakness in pricing, there is something that comes and fills that vacuum, something that comes and moves it back up to uh, the record high or back above 2,500, as in the case now. Uh, today, we hit the highest intraday high ever, I believe 2,570 basis December futures. This is exciting times. These are very exciting times, absolutely, Gary. Um, I let, let's dive into the charts. Let's uh, let, let's t dive into the fundamentals here because I want to know a where sure. are the resistance levels? Are there any gaps that need to be filled? Because this move is so strong, it's so fast, and of course, uh, what's the upside? Uh, let, let's okay. dive into that. Let's discuss all that. And uh, okay, there, here's the chart. Okay, we'll take a look at two charts today, and we'll do this in two different ways. Uh, this first chart is 
just a standard candlestick chart. Each candle represents a day. And what I am pointing out was the unique scenario that we've talked about. For example, here in April, this is the first of a new record close, a new record close, a new record close, and of course this one. But here's what I found is interesting. The tail on a candlestick is the differential between the real body, which is the relationship between the open and closing price and the high or the low. We're going to focus on these upper wicks, meaning the intraday high into the body. So you've got this first occasion. If you can see, it's a. I wish I could have the wicks come in a little bit stronger, but you've got a wick that comes right to this area. This is a quintuple top. We've got one, two, three, four, and then five. Five occasions in which gold had the, the force to drive up to $2,520, but on each and every occasion, it failed only to trade back below that. And that's why what we witnessed a few days ago, Friday, was so significant. I'm labeling it as a major breakout because it does effectively railroad through these levels that I believe were former resistance and now I believe have a, a high probability of becoming technical support. And the amount of times that gold tested, not 2,500, but 2,520 unsuccessfully, the fact that it broke above that is exceedingly significant and exceedingly strong. And in fact, you were asking me right before we went on the recording about a candle that gives you a good feeling of trend strength. It's called a Henkinashi. And the only difference between, even though it looks like a candlestick chart, the big difference is it derives, it's open from the midpoint of the prior candle. So it tends to filter out the noise. And that's why you get these smooth, brilliant moves up and moves down. It becomes very clear when a, when a market's in a rally or when it's in a correction. And I draw your attention to these last three days, tremendously large candle size, A. B, no lower wick. And the importance of this lower wick on the way up, why it's important that there isn't one, is what that means is that at no point during the trading session did gold trade to or below the midpoint of the prior candle. And when you have this, this what in Japanese they call it a, a marabozu, a bald bottom, um, when you have this absence of lower wicks on the way up, it means that it was so strong that it opened above the midpoint and never went below that. And that is exceedingly important. And you can see this is still showing that this trend has got a lot of steam. You can look at, uh, let's say, back here in April, you see how you get these doji-like candles, meaning very, very small body size, large wicks. And then you get to pivot from green to red. Here you get a contraction and then to red. Here you get tails on both sides and then to red. And so we have not had any indication that this market has a potential to imminently correct. Of course, like any moving average technical study, it's going to lag behind real time unlike other studies that we do. And so for that reason, we'll see the, that knee-jerk reaction, the pivot, as it's happening or a little bit after as it's reflected in the charts. But that's, that's really what I am seeing currently. We, we can look at uh, a forecast in a little bit if you want. Yeah, no, it's like we'll, we'll get to that. It's like, uh, sure. but uh, you you've taken my worries away. That doesn't seem like there are any major gaps that need to be backfilled. It's been a healthy move. Uh, it's not gapped up. You know, it's like I'm not a technical analyst. I'm making this up as we go here, Gary. But uh, I'm just making sure that uh, you know that this isn't a trap or anything. That people start buying gold at what is it now, twenty five fifty, and uh, all of a sudden we're back testing twenty four hundred tomorrow because there's a technical uh, gap that needs to be filled. It's like, is that statement correct? Would you would you go along with that? You sound like a, a, a seasoned market technician to me. No, that's absolutely correct. There are no gaps. Uh, the way to see a gap, of course, is within, you'll never get a gap in a Hank and Ashi. But here you can see that there's absolutely no gaps whatsoever. 
and haven't been in the market for months. No, fantastic. It, uh, incredibly, incredibly strong. Yeah. Like, l- l- let's forecast a little bit. Like, like <laughs> how, how linear is this trend, Gary? Well, this is this is what I'm looking at in terms of our long term market moves. And this is a combination of Elliott wave theory, Fibonacci retracement, Fibonacci extension. Think of it this way. As a market technician, when we look to see levels of support and resistance, we look at historical points in time in which that stock or commodity, in this case, gold, we look for points of time at how gold reacted when it was at this price point. How did gold react at 2400 or at 2200 or at 2500? So what happens when you're at 2550? The first occurrence of that ever. What can you use to really forecast where we think the upper level is going to be where this particular uh, leg of the rally, because I think we've got a couple of legs to go personally, but where, where do we think it could go? We don't have any historical reference point. So one of the tools that I found invaluable to forecasting is Fibonacci extensions. Uh, most are familiar with Fibonacci retracements. If a stock moves from a dollar to two dollars and then begins to correct, we want to know what percentage it's going to give back. In other words, does it go to a dollar fifty, a fifty percent retracement, a dollar seventy, maybe a twenty three point six percent retracement? The difference with a Fibonacci uh, retracement is we use numbers that are based upon his number sequence which is the building blocks of nature, where you start with zero and one, you add it, you get one, then one plus one equals two, then you get three, then you get five, which is how that spiral is formed in a, uh, when you looking at Fibonacci um, formulas in math. And so what I've done is if we can go back, look at the beginning of the year, typically for those unfamiliar with Elliott Wave, a, a more than quick tutorial is he believes that markets move in patterns based upon the psychology or market sentiment, how investors feel about a market. And we all know that a market doesn't tend to go straight up. If it does, that's called a parabolic move. And typically a parabolic move to the upside is followed by a meltdown to the downside. It goes up very quick, it comes down very quick. Typically, When we see a stock or gold trade, the way a technician can talk about it, it's a series of new highs followed by a lower high and a, I mean, a higher high and a lower and a higher low, excuse me. So it kind of stair steps. It goes from a dollar to two dollars down to a dollar 70, then a dollar 70 to 220. That's stair step. And so in Elliott wave theory, he divides a market move into a eight wave count consisting of a motive phase. And that's the first waves one through five and a corrective phase. In the motive phase, there's a bull count and a bear count, but we're obviously looking at a bull count. We basically look at waves one, three, and five as being our impulse waves in other words the way the points of time in which gold is moving in the primary trend direction which is up and in between each wave is a corrective wave wave two and four and so you get one two three four five and that completes the first half or the cycle the motive phase from there We go into a corrective phase. A corrective phase can be a simple zigzag like an ABC where it goes down, up, and one final down. In the case of what we've seen, not only recently back in May, excuse me, but also in January, is a asymmetrical triangle. In this case, it's been a flat bottom descending top. In other words, you've had a series of equal lows in terms of support and a series of lower highs forming the descending top of the triangle. The theory behind this kind of a pattern is that when it breaks above this upper level resistance line, it is called a thrust. And 
that like a spring in which you've wound it tight as it went through these waves a b c d e continuing uh, continuing to get tighter and as it gets tighter it builds energy and then that breakout look at the size of the candles once it breaks out the interesting thing is we've gotten that twice since descending top flat bottom so i believe that at least as far as this year goes it began in a correction this is january to february therefore my reason for being cautious during that time period because we were trading sideways that changed halfway through february and we had some tremendous rallies the first one taking us up to about 2300 the second one taking us up to about 2500 this was a pretty deep correction going back down to 2360 and then we had our long correction the long correction itself um lasted until the end of june and it the clock then restarts so we've had a wave one we've had our corrective wave two and my belief is we are now in wave three and this is where the forecasting comes into play so this is the current wave and we have been looking at this far before it started to move up we were looking at it when it moved up and down and wondered if it's because you can't you can't cut a picture to fit a frame in other <laughs> words you can you, you can't change the way a formula or a theory works because the real-time data doesn't match it you've got to explain it and so we are i believe in wave three which in elliott wave cannot be the shortest of any of the impulse waves waves one three or five which means at minimum it will move a distance that's equal to the distance of what we're labeling as wave one. Now, wave one starts at 2360, I'm just rounding up or down, up to about 2550. So that move is going to begin, this is where the Fibonacci extension is. We've measured this, we're starting from the end of the correction, a one-to-one -one relationship, in other words, if this current rally has the same amount of dollars gained in gold as this what what we're calling wave one it would take gold to 2585 dollars and that to me is my first target it could go higher it can go as high as 1.618 but i personally i've been so surprised i'd rather be long by underestimating it than calling for $4,000 gold right now. <laughs> so I believe that currently my target is about $2,590 short term over the next 30 to 45 days. And I've said that knowing that it could happen in two weeks. You know, it, it's been amazingly strong. But that's my interim target. I believe that after this, we'll get a correction. And then this final fifth wave, as we got here, before we enter a corrective cycle. And that's really what I'm looking at in terms of my interim forecast and my forecast towards the end of the year, um, first quarter next year, which is why I'm looking for $2,700 in gold per ounce by the end of the first quarter, uh, 2025. Phenomenal, Gary. That was that was extensive and exhaust, exhausting to degree to follow, but it was really informative. I really appreciate that because it really, like, clearly structures like where your mind is at, like how, how you got to the, these targets. You didn't just grasp them out of thin air or anything. So really appreciate that explanation there, Gary. Um, fo follow up question there, of course, as well. I've, I've seen the volume part. So question: Does the volume correlate to to the moves, and is that supportive? Well. Let's go ahead and pull volume like up. There's always something I, I like to follow. It's like, does it happen under low volume? Is it higher volume? So I'm curious. Those well, we've had, we've had really, really decent volume. You can see these these peaks, and they tend, tend to be red, meaning come on, on days in which there's a decline. But this is really strong volume. Uh, right now, we've got, uh, this is, uh, let's see, about 182,000 contracts in terms of open interest that's that is good volume in the market you've exceeded it at certain periods especially you can see this run up here 
when gold ran from uh, 2230 up to this first top. You had tremendous spikes, but you're not getting any kind of very, very low volume. The last time we had low volume, of course, is during the beginning of the year uh, as the market was correcting after coming off of these highs, which were record highs at that point. How does seasonality factor into it? We're at the height of summer. So I mm -hmm. almost expect that volume be a bit lower because, uh, you know, people are only returning to school and their desks now. So how does seasonality factor in? I, I'm not a big, um, I understand that seasonality plays a role and that summer tends to have the lightest volume in the same way a, a holiday might, but I don't tend to factor that in as much because what I'm trying to focus on is price movement and the underlying fundamentals that are moving the market to where they are and looking at what could possibly change that market sentiment. In other words, the only reason gold moves higher is because traders believe gold is going to be higher, which is why they bid into it. They buy it rather than sell it short. It's really based on the psychology of market sentiment. And the beautiful thing about candlesticks, and this is what attracted me to them years ago, is it was the first technical formula that I was ever exposed to that mathematically quantified market sentiment. If you take that sentence apart, you realize that that is an, it's absolutely incredible that there's any theory that can take how somebody feels about something and quantify it in numbers so that it, it can be looked at across the spectrum. That really is, is unheard of. And candlesticks was really the first technical study that I saw that quantified market sentiment, which is why Elliott Way fit in so nice into that kind of toolbox or, or tool bag, I should say, of tools that I use for analysis and forecasting. But the fact that in the 1600s, which is when candlesticks, which is a Nashka hobby, is a Japanese word and it means footprint charts. The idea meaning that if you're walking on a beach uh, barefooted, um, your, your walking leaves marks in the sand footprints. And they tell you not only where you've been, but probably give you a direction as to where, where, where that person is headed. And so that was created in the 1600s in the first commodity exchange, the Dojima Rice Exchange, hundreds of years ago, you know, before any, any of these technicians uh, began to put pencil to paper. And that is fascinating. What's more fascinating to me is that they are still a method that allows you to gain incredible insight today, which tells me that the nature of man, traders haven't changed over hundreds of years. They want to buy when they feel it's undervalued. They want to offset or sell it when they feel that it's overbought. It's got too much value. And those buttons, those uh, motivating factors behind how a trader trades hasn't changed in centuries. In a way, it, it's, it, it's satisfying in that it tells me that there is a constant, which means that we can gain value from using the, these techniques because they've got an exceedingly long history of being valuable tools. Very interesting, Gary. It leads me to a, to a follow-up question there as well. I was just thinking while, while you were talking about those candlesticks and sentiment as well, what what is priced in right now? And I'm looking at uh, wave two to three here, and or third wave here. And uh, okay. I wrote down that the FOMC meeting is about 28 days away. H how does that correlate? And because uh, the market seems to be pricing in at least a couple, almost three rate cuts, 75 basis point minimum. That's why it's so euphoric. Uh, but uh, usually, and we you know that as well as I do. Once the rate cut gets announced, you know, the market usually sells off and uh, some air gets let out of the balloon. Is that, uh, how does that correlate with your charts? You mean a buy on rumor, sell on fact. Um, <laughs> also timeline-wise, like 28 days until the end of wave three here. The one thing Elliott Wave does not 
do in terms of all the benefits is it doesn't really control the time element. A wave is going to take as long as it takes. Uh, so for example, when I'm looking at this wave three, if I'm putting a minimum of 2584, but it could go much higher, I believe that it still has room to the upside. And then when it hits my first target, look for signs of weakness. And the, the Hank and Ashi's way I do it, candlestick patterns and whatnot. I believe that the optimism regarding a rate cut is finally realistic. For, for over, what, a year and a half, people have been wishing or wanting a, an interest rate cut when the Fed was emphatic going, we're not ready. You know, what about rate cuts? We're not ready to discuss that. Powell would quit back or we're not even at that point. He would be exceedingly transparent about, look, let's not talk about rate cuts. We want to get inflation to our target. We're going to focus on that. Then when we got closer, the line was, we need greater confidence. And the only way we're going to get greater confidence is by having more data. <laughs> and so finally, after we had about three months where inflation, it showed that inflation was cooling, unlike Q1, in which the first three months had upticks in inflation, um, the Fed will never use a single month to formulate their, their monetary policy strategy. However, um, when they get a, a consistent amount of data, so the last three months have all clearly shown that inflation is contracting, it's moving on a trajectory to their 2% target. They, the, when I say they, the Fed believes or is anticipating that it will get there sometime in the middle of middle towards the end of 2025. But he, uh, Powell also said, we're not going to wait till it gets to 2% to start cutting rates. A lot of analysts believe, uh, and this is where analysts are funny, there's, there's analysts out there that believe they should have done this much earlier. There are those that right now believe that we shouldn't implement a, a, a rate cut at all. The Fed shouldn't do that. Um, it's all over the board. The spectrum is full in terms of viewpoints. I'm of the belief that I think that they're pulling, if they pull the trigger in September, which according to the CME's FedWatch tool is 100% certainty, about a 25% probability of a quarter percent cut and 75% probability of quarter percent and a 25% probability of a half a percent. So odds are favoring a quarter percent rate cut, which I think is ringing true to me, at least what I believe. The question is, how many interest rate cuts will they implement this year? You said traders are expecting three. That's what the Fed was on record stating in the March and June SEP. The SEP is the summary of economic projections that they come out with with their dot plot. And the dot plot in March was looking for three rate cuts this year. Uh, they they have how many they're they're anticipating next year, 2025 and 26, because to normalize rates, that would take from their current level, five and a quarter, five and a half Fed funds rate down to about three, three and a half. Uh, normalization used to be two. Now they're saying it's three. So be it. Um, how long it takes to get there is an unknown value, but they're anticipating as much as three years. The question to me that's unanswered is, will they cut rates three times this year? Personally, I'm in the camp that believes two is more likely than three. I'd be happier with three, um, but I have to acknowledge I have no idea. Uh, we can guesstimate, we can look at what's out there and then make an assessment, but that assessment, again, the picture's a picture. We can't cut that picture to fit a frame. So whatever the Fed does, the Fed does. So if you recall in June, they were looking for two rate cuts. I am not convinced that I know. In fact, I'm sure I don't know. A two would be a logical move. Three would be an exceptional, because the more, more cuts they enact this year, the more bullish it is for gold bringing down interest rates. And so we'll have to see, but I think that it's absolutely a given that September will be
be the first rate cut since they raised rates in March of uh, what was it, 21 or 22, paused it like eight, nine months ago. So in a long, long time. But here's my takeaway, Kai, and what I think is most important. It's not that they're going to be that they're going to cut rates in September. It's excellent. We've been waiting for it. It's what it implies because it doesn't imply a single rate cut. It implies a major pivot by the Federal Reserve from a highly restrictive monetary policy to a policy in which they're doing interest rate normalization. In other words, they're taking their elevated rates that they had to move it to much too late, by the way. I mean, by the time they implemented their first quarter percent interest rate hike, inflation was sitting above 9% briefly or 8 to 9%. Maybe they got on it a little bit too late, you think? I do. But that's already accepted. The, they don't want to get it wrong in terms of how they begin to normalize rates. And I don't look at it as September is an interest rate cut. I look at it as September will possibly be the moment in time which they pivot and begin to normalize rates, which means that it's how many throughout the year in terms of rate cuts we see and not if there's going to be a rate cut. It's saying much, much more. No, no, it, fantastic. Like lo lots of color there, Gary, especially about sentiment, which is really important. Allow me one last question. And uh, you, you, you could show me off if it doesn't fit in, but the relationship of gold and silver, I'm still intrigued by it because uh, silver is definitely not as strong or definitely not as strong as gold. And you mentioned earlier in the year in January that gold will outperform silver this year. And so far, you're absolutely correct. Gold is up about 32%, silver 22%. Uh, my, I might be off by a couple percentage points, but it's right around 10% difference. What does that look like? Like, And uh, what do the charts tell you on that? Will silver catch up? The charts leave me baffled, I'll be yeah. honest with you. The fact that if we look historically, when gold made its first historic move in the middle of 2011, we saw silver spike to $50. Gold has moved to all time record, new all time record moves many, many times this year. And silver has remained range bound with the upper level being what, 33 in 2021. It hit between 32 and 33. Right now, silver is flirting again with uh, just over 29. The tandemness and high correlation between moves in gold and silver that existed a couple of years ago do not seem to exist now. That's what I can say. They're moving in tandem when they want to, which is less than that used to be, which was gold and silver. When gold moved up, silver would move up. And typically silver move, would move with a greater percentage gain on times of prices sent. And then larger drawdowns, in other words, it would have more significant price declines during periods of correction. But the fact that it kind of got locked at that $33 cap is bewildering to me. I could suggest a lot of possible reasons that that would happen, but I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist because industrial use and demand have been there. So why? Has it been uh, have such a lackluster performance when gold was performing? Well, I can't answer that question, honestly. Um, I can make the observation that what you're saying is absolutely correct. I mean, your point is spot on and it is a valuable insight. Why? I don't have a clue. Hmm. Is is my truthful answer. I can't tell you I understand why, but I can acknowledge, as you just did, that it is happening. Yeah, it's it's obvious, like, and it's mind blowing as well. Like, it has to be with the industrial use and people really worrying about a recession or something that they're not jumping into it hand over fist.
that's uh, I don't know. That's the only logical conclusion I came up with, uh, besides the conspiracy theories you mentioned that it's being held right, back right. by uh, shadow banks and who, whoever you want to believe is, is involved in that. Probably J.P. Morgan at the head of it all, right? Always, but always, <laughs> probably, right? Um, Gary, as always, like we need to make this a monthly thing. Like I always enjoy our conversations. There's so much knowledge and insight in your in your forecasts and your analysis. Where where can we follow more of your work, Gary? Thanks so very much. Thegoldforecast.com, of course, is, is our primary site for our premium subscribers. Uh, those that want to get an idea of what we do there can just go to thegoldforecast.com or the Gold Forecast on YouTube. On our site, we do offer a free trial, 14 days, so that if you're an investor or an active trader, you can try our premium service at no risk to yourself. Over two weeks, get our daily reports our trade alerts in which we actually recommend specific buys with stop placements. They get sent out SMS, text message, as well as email. And then after two weeks, see if that service is valuable to you. If it aids in making you a more profitable trader, making better decisions, by all means, it's going to be well worth the cost to be a premium subscriber. And if you don't see the value in it, if it doesn't enhance your trading or your insight, then by all means, we don't want you to have to pay for something you're not getting something out of. So you just send us an email and you're never billed uh, for the premium uh, service. The goldforecast.com is by far. And then lastly, my Twitter handle, Gary S. Wagner, at Gary S. Wagner. Phenomenal. Gary, uh, what, what a tremendous conversation as always. Thank you so much for your time. Mahalo. And uh, we'll have to do this again very soon. It's not going to be seven months again, I promise. Like I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm taking hold notes. You, I'm going to hold you to that. Please do. I love, Please I love do. talking with you, Kai. No, likewise. No, no likewise. Okay. And uh, we, we actually skipped a couple topics, but uh, we've covered so much ground, like it would have been too much. So we'll have to catch up on that next time. But uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. As you might have noticed, I tremendously enjoy speaking with Gary. He's probably one of my favorite guests here on the channel. I really do enjoy chatting with him. Lots of insights, lots of knowledge. And uh, so far, he's been spot on in his gold, gold forecast. So make sure to follow his service, thegoldforecast.com. Leave a comment, leave a like. like do you think Gary is full of doo-doo or is he, is, he, is he right? So far, he's got a phenomenal track record. I like listening to Gary and I, I like following what he's saying. Leave, let it, leave a comment. How, how, do you, how are you positioned? And uh, if you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, we'll be back with lots more here on Sword Financial.